Hi students, I want to go over some of the details for the hominin species and descriptions for chapter 10. Firstly, in order for you to get through this, I have put together a summary of species that I want you to be more than a little familiar with. And those are on the hominin review sheet posted in Canvas or HRS. Hominin review sheet has three pages. The first page and the second page are chapter 10. Looks like this, here's the first page. Yes, and backwards for you. And then the second page is a separate section, but also still in chapter 10. The last page has two species that are in 11 and one species that in chapter 12. So before you get started with anything else, you need the hominin review sheet and you need to also take a look at those three PowerPoints that are in Canvas that tell you by chapter 10, 11, 12, what specific details are the most important for you. This is an intro level course for non-majors. And so it's really about the big concepts involved in looking at evolutionary history of a taxonomic group. In this case, it's tribe hominini. Tribe hominini. Tribe hominini means any species, ancient or modern, extinct or still present, that is a biped. So that's why your chapter started with the three sections on bipedality and your quiz for this particular unit is also about those biped sections. A biped then is our most unique feature of our line. Our line means our ancestors and of course us. The most important thing as we get started is for you to be very aware with this particular unit that until very recently, within maybe as little as 30,000 years, maybe less, there were always multiple hominins on the planet beginning about seven million years ago. So we are not completely unique um, as some people have grown up with or in sometimes also in spiritual views and so forth. We are just the last remaining hominins. So tribe hominini in English, hominin. Okay, working with the review sheets. On a separate video presentation, I will put together some um, suggestions on how to use the hominin review sheet, one, to get the um, class activity points, and two, to put together something better for you in order to answer questions. Yes, I know college students, when they get an online exam, want to look everything up. On this one, it's nearly impossible unless you're really, really familiar with all the materials to begin with, because um, go ahead and um, pause this right now and pull out your hominin review sheet. Okay, have it. All right, look down, page one. Auroran tugenensis, Ardipithecus ramidus, Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus afarensis, Kenianthropus platyops, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus pamedius, Australopithecus sediba, and then on to the next group. Australopithecus ethiopicus, Australopithecus boisei, Australopithecus robustus. See it? Yeah, what's the issue here? It isn't going to be easy in a timed um, um, evaluation situation unless you've written these out, unless you've lurked, worked with the terms and the names and the best, most effective and easiest way to work these is, is actually to write them out a few times um, and make sure always that you keep the page one species in one group and the page two species in a separate because they do have slightly different adaptations. Body-wise, not very different. The differences are really going to be in uh, cranial and dental features. And that's why in the chapter, once you start reading the summaries of the species, that you're going to see that the illustrations are overwhelmingly um, pointing out features of the cranium, right, of the upper part. And so it's because of diet. You will have to read the, the uh, chapter to get through, but this should make it a little bit easier. Okay, so... First couple things, why is everything on page one together? And what is it that you're working on for these? Yes, the name, and then the date of the first appearance, and then um, a general um, 
explanation or taking a look at how things work. Let me see how this is gonna, yeah, this works a little bit this way, pointing towards the light. Over here behind me, um, all three of my cats are there, but right now they're asleep. So hopefully they stay asleep and they don't start wandering around. Yes, because working at home, it's awesome, right? Okay, so when we're looking at cranial remains of ancestors, just like you have in your textbook, there are a couple things to remember. One, all of them are hominins and so are you, and they belong then to order primates. So the dental formula is gonna be the same as any old world primate, two, one, two, three molars. And so that part is not gonna be any difference. They're primates, so they're gonna have a short nose, but any length that's here lower in the face is gonna be because of longer jaws. And you guessed it, longer jaws means bigger teeth. The bigger your teeth are, the longer the bone has to be. They don't, though, have the same type of vertical arch above the eyes that we do in modern humans. So they're not as inflated up top or as vertical. It lays down. And as you can see here, it squeezes in you know, we go over here, yeah, a little bit better. It squeezes in right here, right behind the orbits. And both of these, the lack of volume here and the squeezing here means that their brain size is smaller than ours. It's still quite large for a relatively small mammal, but it is much smaller than what we have in modern humans today. Um, so they're gonna be heavier here in the zygomatic please be sure that you continue to work on the bone names. You're going to have a little bit of challenge answering questions um, if you don't stay reviewed with those. So this would be a sort of a generic, um, this is a, a um, copy of a fossil, it's not a real fossil, um, of a real species. This is Australopithecus africanus in this particular case, but all of them on page one are going to be very, very similar in general um, details here. So um, on these, what we're going to see is they're very long this way in the PowerPoint for chapter 10. The vocabulary term for this is prognathic, projecting jaw. In other words, they're quite a long ways in front of the forehead here. They're also, the frontal bone here, unlike yours, which is very vertical, the frontal bone lays back. So it is somewhat flattened looking. And again, that's just because the brain volume is smaller. A flattened frontal bone gives you not an angle that's almost 90 degrees, but one that angles back much further this way. And so we're going to say that they are flattened or platy cephalic, very platycephalic for these. They've also got post orbits, that just means behind, constriction, that means squeezing right here, um, completely opposite of how we look today. And then for everything on page one, we're going to use as a group an average cranial capacity of 450 mLs or cc's, milliliters or cc's. It actually ends up being the same size, just depends on whether they do the measurement with liquids or with solids. So about 450 mLs or cc's. Now with the data that we have right now for all the species on page one, we're seeing if there is enough bone data or skeletal data that males are larger than females. And we learned this about some of the primate groups in the previous unit, particularly those that are terrestrial or larger, uh, where the males are larger than the females. And there's a few other kinds of things that are going on that we don't uh, need to get into for our um, particular specifics for this class. So they are sexually dimorphic. So real quick right now for your notes, males on page one, if we have the data, which we do for Ramidus, Anamensis, Afarensis, Africanus, Prometheus, and Sediba, the males are going to be larger and heavier than the females. In general, what we're looking for, uh, looking at in these um, early or gracile group, 
of hominins is that the males are in the neighborhood of maximum five foot and maximum 100 pounds. That's not very big. So me, flat-footed without any shoes on, I'm 5'4". I frequently feel like I'm kind of short in public these days. People are getting taller, I think. And um, so they would be a goodly amount. Now that's the biggest, um, heaviest, most um, most uh, scary looking of those. So not large, right? Not a, not a large ancestor. The females are quite a bit smaller though. The smallest that we found is actually the Lucy fossil. And she only comes in at about um, three feet, less, a little less than three feet, around 30 to 36 inches. Um, the, most of the females are a little bit taller than that, maybe around 40 inches, and are weighing at the most maybe about 65 pounds. So these are not large ancestors. All of our memes of your ancestors in Africa going around killing or intimidating other animals, that's not accurate. And your textbook also shows that there's a lot of data that they were being grabbed by hunting eagles. They were being eaten by the uh, tree living cats and they were hunted, right? They were prey, not a predator species. We also do know that some of these species did use a variety of tools, some of them even stone tools, but the stone tools are just for extracting raw materials from the landscape. They're not for killing anything. Okay, so that's the basics for the page one. Now on page two, um, do read through that. It's titled Robust or Pear Anthropist Group got a couple sentences of explanation. Your textbook talks about those too. Now the robust or paranthropist group, and particularly for questions where we're asking you to identify one or the other or tell um, or respond to what the name of some of these features for. As you can see already, now this is also no taller no taller in the males than what we see in the early or the robust group. So still really minimally right around five foot, maybe a little bit more. So five foot, right, is 60 inches, maybe a little bit more than 60 inches. The females are a little bit taller in this group. Again, could just be statistical error, but again, closer into the four foot range. So, right, about a foot tall, shorter than the males. The males, though, seem to be heavier in this group um, from the data that we have. So males in this group, perhaps 110 to 20 pounds. Females seem to be averaging right about 75 pounds. Again, still very, very um, lightweight um, for these. However, when we take a look, and like there, you see it in your reading, when we take a look at the cranium, we can see huge differences for these. Now, average cranial capacity for page two is around 500 cc's or mils, and the only difference is really because they're heavier. Your brain size is in proportion to your body size. So even in modern humans, someone who's 4'10 and weighs 90 to 100 pounds, has a perfectly well-functioning brain that's pretty um, much noticeably smaller than a person that's maybe seven foot tall and, and um, in a lean weight weighs 275 or something like that, um, like mass, some basketball players and so forth. So, right, because your heart is also bigger when you're bigger, your lungs are also bigger when you're bigger, same thing with your brain. Now for these though, there are three features that you're gonna see in your reading that go together all the time for these and they have to do with diet. Um, and so let me hold the just the um, mandible of this one, because this is a page two, a robust or paranthropist group, next to the mandible of a page one, about three million year old um, ancestor. And if you look at them side by side this way, you can see there's quite a bit of difference. Is that over here or down this way? Quite a bit of difference in how huge the jaw is and how large the teeth are. Let me get really much closer here. See those molars? Those molars are enormous on the page two on the robusts. And the vocabulary term for that is mega dot molars. The hinge for the jaw is also much larger on the this guy on page two on a robust, you can see that the hinge is much longer and wider. It means that it's got better bite strength, a lot more bite strength, but no sharp pointy teeth. Again, this is really for 
chewing extremely tough vegetation or cracking things open with the teeth. And then when we look um, again for just basic length, and if I hold them up this way, you can see that the one in the back is quite a bit larger. So, but the amount of bone that's here at the bottom, really super thick on these and this one as well. Um, the color is just based on what the company that made these decided to do. So robust, a much bigger jaw with um, much bigger molars. These are also, though, they're closer to what we have um, today, but um, really definitely both of them, even though they're quite shorter than the average modern human, because modern human females now statistically standard for the planet is about 5'4" and about 165 pounds for modern uh, human females. And for males, the global average is about 5'10 and about um, 175, 180 for modern adult males. So this looks, um, this comes from an individual that would be quite a bit shorter than we are and lighter than we are. But if I put this jaw on, you can see that this is nothing close to the size of a modern human jaw. Oh, and by the way, I have one so I can hold it up. Look at how teeny our modern jaw is compared to these really early ancestors. They, um, all the same number of teeth, right? Um, this is a little bit wider uh, towards the back than ours. This is a little bit more U-shaped. You're looking at that in chapter 10, but just the size of the molars alone, too, if we compare them, it's just um, unbelievably bigger molars. The front teeth, not so much different. Some, not a huge amount. In the first page, the gracile and the older ones, um, and the oldest of the hominins, it is noticeably bigger, but the difference is a little less remarkable. So yeah, for us, we had a tiny little, tiny little jaw. And here's another other big one for all of your questions, but let me pull uh, this one back up again for you on this. See how this is coming down this way? No ancestor other than ourselves, and we date back to about 300,000 years ago, have, see the little um, shelf that goes forward on this one? That is a gin shelf, and that doesn't exist on any ancestor. So quizzing exams, did any of these have a chin? The answer is no for all of them, no chin. So see, no chin coming through. The chin doesn't increase strength. It doesn't have any muscular attachments. In fact, it just seems to be a random uh, mutation that's there because of um, genetic drift. So, okay, so on the second one. So the other details then for these, that you're gonna have these enormous megadont molars go along with a face that has just a gargantuan zygomatic with a huge amount of space back here that it creates. And that's to allow those chewing muscles to go up underneath the zygomatic, right? When you clench your jaw, you feel motion here and up here, but not over the top. So those muscles go below. We have a super uh, weak teeth now and a super weak jaw now. Our ancestors had a little bit more and these had the most. Um, and so this big bundle of muscle goes through here, which forces this out at a wide flare. And then those super powerful muscles have to hold on to something. It'd be kind of like a rock climber and um, not having anything that, that you can put your fingertips around yeah, harder to hold on. So these come up and around and attach to this bony ridge at the top. And that ridge is called a sagittal crest. This area down the center is your sagittal area. This is the sagittal crest right here um, on these. So sagittal crest, page two, robust. Sagittal crest is always with extremely widely flaring zygomatic and the Megadont molars for those. Are these also flattened? Yes, so they are very platy. Platy sounds like plate, and that's what it means, platycephalic. And do they have a forward projecting maxilla and mandible? Yes, so they're also extremely prognathic. Okay, so there's your two basic differences. Yes, I'm getting out of the screen as I set things down. Your two basic differences between page one and page two. Last little note here as I wrap up from this one, you will need to look at the chapter 10 PowerPoint 
it has a list of a number of nicknames. The general public is never going to learn Australopithecus Ethiopicus or Australopithecus Prometheus or Aurora Tugenensis. Instead, in the news, and this actually starts in the 1920s with the very first, uh, the discoveries of these very early hominins, all of which are from either East or South Africa. Um, for those with nicknames, everything from the uh, fossil that's called Lucy from the 1970s to fossils known as um, Ardy, again from the 1990s to um, the um, Lytoli footprints. Um, the one of the more recently discovered fossils, uh, Littlefoot, that you have on your list and um, so on and so forth. So the very first was the Tong child fossil. So the general public doesn't have to have these, but they do have the nicknames. For you all, nickname and the, the um, species, right? The real taxonomic designation is part of getting college credit for the class. Okay, good work. Keep working on these and be sure that you're not trying to use the hominin review sheet itself as your notes for answering questions. It's really a ton of data on the sheet. The spelling of the names is very um, similar on many. You're gonna need to put that onto a different type of study uh, review or document, or really best, um, you can just do it by memorization by just going down. Again, date of first appearance, region of Africa, east or south, tip, for, for, for chapter 10, more of them are from east than south. So which list would I memorize? South. Which are the ones from south? Then everything else is going to be from east. And also you will see questions that refer to a visual of a map. So there'll be word questions. There'll be visual questions for anatomy. And they will be fits questions that ask you to identify which group you're looking at and what those um those phenotypes for chewing and diet actually mean. All right, thanks very much.